Well, good afternoon. Welcome back to Central Ontario, GP Outdoors. Finally getting a little bit of sun peeking out through the rain clouds, but uh, hopefully she'll hold out for just a few more minutes while we do the video. Today we're going to talk about things I wish I'd known the day I got my tractor delivered. So if you've got a few minutes for me, grab a coffee and let's talk for a bit. Cheers. <music> So thanks for sticking around. We've had a lot of great new subscribers that have joined the channel over the last few months and a lot of them are first time tractor owners like myself or folks that are currently in the middle of doing diligence to buy their first tractor or have ordered it and they're waiting for delivery and pretty excited. So several of them had asked me over the last month or two if I could put together a video just of tips, advice, things that I've learned as I've learned with my tractor and as you know most of what I've learned has come from my subscribers, uh, which I really appreciate. We've got a lot of experienced, long-time tractor owners on the channel, as well as my neighbor Guy, who's had a tractor for a long time, and things that I've learned just from doing the job and trying to practice and learn how to use the tractor the right way. So if you are new to the channel, I know there's a lot of videos there to go through, but just to take you back a little bit, today marks the 11th month that I've had this tractor. And what you'll see on the channel is if you go back to video number 26, I did that in February, about four months after I got my tractor, and outlined some of the helpful advice or tips I'd gotten from subscribers at that point that I thought was helpful. At the six month mark, I put out a video which I think is number 36, which was called, you know, if you're buying a new compact tractor, it provided some tips or advice as to how, you know, some of the diligence I did when I was looking for my first tractor. And today now at the 11th month mark, I'm going to call this things I wish I knew when my tractor got delivered. And this basically covers some additional things I've learned since the sixth month, which I think might be helpful for you if you've got a new tractor. So if you're an experienced tractor owner, hope you'll stick around, listen in, and, and as always, and what I always tell new subscribers is if you're watching the videos, also take a look at the comments because we have a, a big complement of experienced tractor owners that have been kind enough that they'll always offer advice or tips or suggestions in the comments, which really help you, especially if it's your first tractor. So let's get going and let's get this done today before the rain comes. So one of the most important things I've learned over the last several months, which I never knew, and I honestly never knew, is I thought that when you were using the front end loader or your three point hitch, or you were doing work with the tractor, that you always had to have your throttle at the maximum. And for this B2601, that's about 2800 RPM. What I found out uh, <laughs> actually just recently is that the tractor actually will be able to lift and do probably, you know, not exact, but about 95 or 97 percent of its work at just above idle. So for the longest time, I every time I used my tractor, I had her screaming at 2800 RPM right down to the max, and I was lifting buckets of gravel or pulling a box blade or doing different things. And what you realize, now that I know, is that even at just slightly above idle, you can still lift that full bucket of gravel and you can still pull stuff behind and you can, you can do most of the things you need to do with the tractor without barely revving the RPMs. The nice thing about leaving them low as well is not only that it's probably good for the engine, but as you're trying to learn how to fell and curl and, and use the front end loader or use the, the rear end of your tractor, it's a lot nicer at lower RPMs because everything moves a lot slower. So when you're revving at 2800 RPMs all the way up on the red line, and you try to use your front end loader or lift or curl, it's moving really fast. And it's so difficult when you just got your first tractor to try to learn how to use the joystick and do all those motions, but it's so much easier when you do it at a low RPM. Not to mention, you don't have the engine screaming in your ear all the time. So speaking about the front end loader and the bucket or grapple or whatever you're carrying on the front loader arms, another thing which I know I've mentioned in previous videos is, I've learned is that these loader arms are actually basically hung off of one hinge on either side and then you've got your pistons uh, for your hydraulics. So when you're picking up a bucket of gravel or you're trying to dig a load out or do anything with the front end, you always try to make sure that you're centering your target between in the middle of your front end. You don't want to be taking a bucket, for example, and say there's a rock in the ground. You don't want to try to take one corner of the bucket and dig in because what happens is you start digging in and all the energy is focused lopsided on the one end of the tractor or the front of the, the loader arms 
And what will happen is you'll actually see it if you try, if you're pulling hard enough, you'll see that the loader arms start to twist because they're basically hanging free. And so you always want to make sure that if you're doing work with the front end, always try to center the target in the middle, never on the sides. So if you're like me, I don't have a level indicator on my tractor. And I know some people can buy them as aftermarket, and it's kind of, it's like a stick that goes down the side of a loader arm, and it helps you determine when your bucket is actually level uh, to the ground. And it took me a little while to figure it out, but what I found out through a lot of research is that I think with most manufacturers, or at least with Kubota, there's always a piece of metal somewhere on the bucket that is in fact at the same angle as the bottom of your bucket. And in this case with the B2601 in this bucket, this piece of metal right here sits on the exact same angle as the bottom of the bucket. So now instead of trying to look around the loader arms to try to figure out when I'm level, I know that if I look at this piece of metal on the side, that I know that I'm seeing the level indicator of the entire bucket. And I'll tell you, it helps tremendously. So if you don't have a level indicator or you don't want to use one or buy one, take a look at the, your bucket with the manufacturer, whatever type of tractor you have, and I'm pretty sure that you're going to find somewhere on that bucket the manufacturer has bent or angled a piece of the metal on the top of the bucket somewhere to match the angle of the bottom of your bucket. Makes it a whole lot easier digging into a pile of gravel, I'll tell you. So if you're similar to myself and you have a third function valve on the front of your tractor or you've got remotes in the back, what you're probably finding sometimes as a new tractor owner is you're trying to hook up your grapple or your, your snow blower or whatever to these uh, extra set of hoses and you're probably finding that your quick couplers are hard to push in. And the reason why is because when you disconnect this unit the last time, the hydraulic fluid in here is still under pressure. And of course so is your tractor. So when you're trying to push your quick connects in, you basically have a high pressure pushing into a high pressure and you're not getting them to connect. And I can assure you for months, I don't know how many times I had to take wrenches out and disconnect and undo these couplers to drain out some fluid so I could get them pushed in. What I did learn, as you'll know on one of the other videos, is cycle your joystick and then push it into float before you do it with the tractor off. The other thing which I've learned is that if you warm up the tractor and you try to put these on in the middle of the day, similar to any other fluid, when it's hot outside, the fluid gets hot and it expands, which creates more pressure. So if you know you're going to be using your grapple tomorrow, Either late tonight put it on or first thing in the morning when it's still cool out because the oil is still pretty cool and it reduces the pressure and makes it a lot easier to couple. So for some of you, you've probably noticed as you look into the background of a lot of my videos, you'll notice that I've got my implements on the ground and they're usually under blocks of wood or in some cases skids. And what I found is that it's a lot easier trying to connect stuff to your three point hitch or to the front end loader if you've got them as level as possible, because you know your ground's usually not level, uh, unless you're you know, fortunate enough to have a garage and get your skids in there, and hopefully one day I will. But in the meantime, I use skids, I put wood underneath them to try to level them as I take them off the tractor because it makes it that much easier to get them back on. And don't forget, as, you, as I mentioned in my previous video, I think number 26, most tractors, your three-point three hitch will not drop all the way to the ground. So it's kind of very helpful to have them up off the ground another six or eight inches because it just makes it easier to get those lower control arms up. So you're getting your first tractor. If you're anything like myself, you know, I'm a little handy around the house, so I've got a workshop and I've got, you know, a normal socket set and wrenches and screwdrivers and drills, those kind of things. But what I didn't realize until after I got the tractor is that the nuts and bolts on this tractor are pretty huge and they far exceed the size of any standard socket set you're going to pick up at your local hardware store for your home. So a few uh, tools that you need to keep in mind when you get your new tractor. You're going to need a torque wrench, for sure, because when you buy implements for the tractor, a lot of the implements will come with the manual, and in the back of the manual it'll tell you every bolt that's in that implement, and it'll tell you the torque rating for each of those bolts. Also, when you look at the tractor manual, you'll find that in the back it lists every bolt on the tractor and it also gives you the torque measurements. Very important to have a torque wrench. This is actually my very first torque wrench I've ever owned in my entire life. But I've got one because I need one for the tractor. Second thing you're going to need if you don't have one, grease gun. Every 10 hours, at least on this Kubota, you need to grease all of your fittings. And it's pretty handy to have a, a good quality grease gun because it goes a long way. It only takes 5-10 minutes, but you've got to make sure you get it done, so you need one of these. And the last thing you need, as I mentioned earlier, is you're going to need to find yourself a new set of sockets and a, and a bigger wrench because the bolts on this tractor are huge. 
And I'm pretty sure that unless you're an automotive guy or you've, you know, you've got a big workshop with a lot of tools, you probably don't have sockets this big. So a couple of things about your PTO and the rear end of your tractor. Your PTO here, in this case on the B2601, we've got a mid PTO as well as a rear PTO. You always want to make sure it's properly greased and it's protected. Always good to keep your cap on when you're not using it. However, uh, something which I found, and I just want to put a little shout out to Macuno, uh, because he had just mentioned this on his channel about a month ago, and I also had a subscriber who gave me this tip about a month and a month and a half ago. And basically, when you're putting an implement on the back of your tractor that requires a PTO, and you're trying to get the shaft aligned, you'll probably notice that when you're engaged on your lever, and I'll show you above me, the PTO on the back of the tractor will not budge, which means that you end up trying to um, put your PTO shaft in, line up the grooves, and then you find yourself in an awkward position because nine times out of ten, the grooves will not line up when you get back to your implement. So you end up having to, you know, spin the blades on your mower or do something with the implement to try to turn the drivetrain to get them to line up. It takes a long time, and it's a tough one because, for example, with the wood chipper, I literally have to unbolt it, open it up, and spin the rotor to get the, the shaft to line up. What we found out and what actually works on this tractor and probably works on yours is if you take the lever, push it into the forward position onto the mid PTO, it actually releases this one. And although it's still going to be a little tight, you can grab it with your hand and turn it, which makes it so much easier to put an implement on the back of your tractor. Second thing, if you are running an implement off your PTO on the rear, you probably have a drawbar for towing like I do here. Always make sure that you remove the drawbar before you put the implement on and start using it because you don't want the drawbar to get in the way of the PTO shaft as it rolls up and down in the back of your tractor. So while we're talking about the rear and the mid PTO, you've probably found that your tractor has a lot of little safety switches and, and safety precautions on it. For example, if you're sitting on the seat and say you're snow blowing or you're using the rear or the mid PTO and you get up off the seat, you'll notice the tractor shuts off. A couple of people had asked me back several months ago how it was possible that I was able to get off the tractor and still use my rear or mid PTO. And what you're going to find when you read your manual is that you probably have a two position switch similar to the Kubota here. If it is a Kubota, it's probably the same. But if you're sitting in the seat and you engage PTO and try to get off the seat, the tractor knows that something's wrong and it shuts down the tractor. If you are going to use the PTO, i.e., you know, a wood chipper or something where you don't need to be present in the driver's seat or in the operator's chair. What you want to do is turn your tractor on, get it going, and then before you engage your PTO, take your seat, pull it forward, and basically what you'll see here is there's a two position switch under your seat. When you're sitting on it, it goes into one position, and that tells the tractor, hey, if you use the PTO, there's an operator in the seat. If he gets up, shut the tractor off. When you lift the seat up, it goes into its second position and that tells the tractor, hey, nobody is going to be in the operator seat, it's okay to engage the PTO. And after you lift the seat, that's when you engage your front PTO or your rear PTO. And then what you'll find is the tractor will work just fine so long as you keep the seat up. If you have the PTO engaged and you drop the seat back down, it will shut the tractor off. So the last piece I want to talk to you about as it pertains to the PTO is PTO protection. So if, as you probably know or you'll learn, your rear and your mid PTO are actually directly connected into your transmission and the gears underneath your tractor. And basically what that means is when the tractor's running and you've engaged it, you have direct connection of energy transferring from the um, transmission below out into the PTO shafts, which will then of course transfer that energy into the implement you're trying to drive or run. So, for example, if you have a wood chipper, which is a great example, you've got the wood chipper on the back, you've connected your PTO shaft, you engage, you rev up your RPMs to your 540 because you're required to do that all the way up, and you start using the wood chipper. If, for example, whether it's the wood chipper or the mower or any other type of, you know, my snowblower at the front, anything that you're driving off of that PTO is now transferring that injury directly from your transmission. So if you don't have protection on that implement, what happens is if something happens where it jars or jams, or there's um, too much stress on that implement for whatever reason, that stress or that additional energy or that shock is carried right through to your transmission unless you have protection. So what's really important is you've got to make sure that whatever implements you're buying either have a slip clutch, it's called, 
uh, or they're belt driven with a slip belt. Uh, for example, my finish mower has a belt on it that's on a spring and you know, if it hits a rock or it hits something that's going to jar it or create an issue for the PTO through into my transmission, it'll slip. The, one of the most common things I found is this thing called a shear bolt. And uh, I, I didn't know much about them until I got this tractor, to be honest, but it looks just like a basic bolt. But the important thing for the video today is that when you buy an implement, you want to ask the dealer or the manufacturer or the store that you're buying it from, how is my PTO protected with this piece of equipment? And what I found out this summer is that although you have a lot of equipment that is covered or, or it's protected with a shear bolt, there are different grades of shear bolt. And what it means, the grades mean basically is that different grades of shear bolts will shear or break under certain types of pressures or perhaps torque. And if you have a really strong, like a grade five shear bolt on your little compact tractor, it's not going to protect your transmission much most likely because it's going to take a lot of stress to break that bolt. So for all of my implements, I run a grade two bolt. The grade two and bolt will shear and cut the power a lot quicker than a grade five or something stronger. So make sure whatever you're buying for the tractor, it's got protection and you understand what type of protection it has for your transmission. And in the case of it, they're saying it's shear bolt protected, you'll see on the drive line or, or in the drive line of the implement, you'll find a bolt and you need to ask them what grade is that bolt. Because if they're selling you a piece of equipment, most pieces of equipment they sell are applicable to a large range of tractors. And you have to make sure that it's not got a bigger bolt than your tractor could take because the damage to that transmission will cost you a lot of money. I know that was a long-winded discussion, but it's so important, and I'm really glad that I learned it. Got a lot of advice and help from my subscribers, and that's how I know about it. So we talked about the draw bar when we were talking about the PTO in the back, and whenever you put something on there with a drive shaft, always remove your draw bar. But as it pertains to the draw bar, I just wanted to make sure of something that I learned myself. When you read the manual, you'll see that somewhere in your tractor's manual, it'll have a chart that will talk to you about the, the maximum weights or capacities of different parts of your tractor. And I wanted to make sure, because I was a little confused myself, uh, but when you look at your manual, the weight that your draw bar can pull is not the same as the weight that your three-point hitch can pull. And it's very important to find out or to make sure you're very clear on the difference. The draw bar, for example, on the B2601 will pull 2,000 pounds. But remember, it's pulling laterally a static load. Your three-point hitch is not intended so much to pull things, it's intended to lift things. So the difference between the capacity of what your tractor might be able to trailer on a, on a draw bar versus, you know, a lot of us have little trailer hitches we hook up on a three-point hitch, but just because the draw bar pulls 2,000 pounds does not mean that your three-point hitch is also going to be able to pull 2,000 pounds. Because the three-point hitch's job is to lift up and down, not to pull so much. So it's important that you check out your manual. If you can't understand it or if it's not clear, talk to your dealer because ripping or cracking that case around your three point, your hydraulic case in that three point hitch, is gonna be a costly, costly repair and it will not be covered by warranty if you're pulling too much weight with it. So you're pretty excited, tractor's here or it's on its way and it comes in the next day, you jump in the seat and you wanna to get to work because you know there's so many things you can do on your property with your new tractor. And what I'd offer to you is that as you're thinking about all the different things you can do in your property, there's that old saying of plan your work and work your plan. Uh, it's great that the tractor could dig rocks out or pick up branches or, or grab, you know, timbers of trees that are 12 feet long or pick up debris out of the forest. But before you start doing that, think about what you're going to do after you, you pick something up. So, for example, you'll know this year I started a rock wall. And the reason I started the rock wall is because I started digging all the rocks out of my garden or out of my grass and out of the back and realized I needed somewhere to put them after I dug them up. So what I did is I just basically started a rock wall, and that's where I'm dropping all my rocks, and it's actually coming along pretty nice. I've got a burn pile. I, I also have a pile where I put branches if I'm not going to chip them right away. And I also have a pile where I put logs or timbers before I, I end up splitting them. And it just makes it a lot easier when you're doing different work around the property each day when you know that if I'm grabbing a rock, I know where I'm putting it. If I've got debris that I've got to burn, I've got a burn pile, I've got a pile for... Uh, logs and I've got a pile for branches and whatever else you might need on your property but think about it ahead of time and that way you know that as you're working your property and doing different things you know exactly what you're going to do once you've you know you've picked up that unit or that debris 
So I wanted to finish the video on a very important note, last but not least as it were. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up and talk to you a little bit about it, especially if you're a new tractor owner or this is your first tractor. Safety. Safety is so important because although these things are, are more commercialized now and a lot more of us have them, these are beasts. They got a lot of power and they can do a lot of damage. So you have to treat it with the respect it deserves in my view. And again, these are just my views. I'm not an expert and I'm certainly not casting judgment on anybody else. Uh, everybody's got to decide you know, how and what they want to do as far as safety goes for themselves. But in my view, there's a couple of things which I think are really important for you to consider. If you're going to be working the tractor and working out in your property, get yourself a good pair of safety boots. Green patch, steel shank, steel toe. That's it. Get them. Good solid footing no matter where you're walking and when you're working and stepping up and down and off the tractor. And you've got the protection around your feet because, you know, whether it's stuff that you're lifting that might fall or it's things you're doing in the forest, you want to make sure that you've got the right protection on your feet. And, and you don't have to buy the big fancy pair of boots. You can just get a basic pair of boots, green patch certified, and you'll be good. Second thing, gloves. Get a good pair of work gloves. You want to protect your hands and keep them protected. You're working around a lot of metal, a lot of mechanical things, grease, a lot of different things, and you want to make sure you're not pinching fingers. You've got some good gloves on. Uh, one thing I wanted to address, I know uh, over the last several months, several people have asked me, why do I have my four-way flashers going when I'm on my own property? And the reason why, it's a safety reason. Uh, similar to yourself, probably, I've got neighbors that drop by unannounced virtually every day here. I also have neighbors that have kids that have ATVs, and I've always told them they're more than welcome to drive their ATVs through my forest and up and down my long driveway because it gives them something to do, and, and it's, you know, it gives them a little bit of area to play. And so I always want to make sure that if... I'm out working the tractor, whether it's in the forest or out in the clearing or the lawn or wherever I am, especially on the driveway, I always put my four-ways on because it's going to give a little bit more visibility in the event that I've got, you know, some young lad whipping around the corner on his ATV with the engine screaming in his ear and he can't hear my tractor. That's why I use the four-way flashers. Last thing on safety, ear protection. I don't use ear protection because I love to hear the sound of the tractor. I love to get used to understanding the sounds it makes when I do different things so I can get to learn what the tractor sounds like when it's healthy because I think that's going to help me when I figure out very quickly if it's sick or something's wrong. But if you are concerned about your ears, just get a, a pair of simple ear protection and get them anywhere. They're pretty cheap. Um, again, not trying to suggest uh, or, or be you know judgmental about you know anybody else's choices, but I would also offer to you that if you're new with a tractor, it's going to take you a long time to learn, and, and you'll see videos and YouTube channels from different people who have been riding tractors all their life. Uh, but I would just offer that, I know they make the earphones with the fancy Bluetooth music and uh, radio, and you can put them on, do your work, and you've got the radio or ACDC going off in your ears. But I would offer that until you get as good as those folks are, maybe you know call it your formative years for the next few years as you're trying to learn how to use this equipment properly, you really need to pay attention to every single thing you're doing. You need to be very attentive on this tractor, whether you're backing up, uh, trying to learn all the different levers. And the last thing I think um, that's helpful is having music blaring in your ears while you're trying to do it. Uh, it's just my personal view, something for you to consider, especially as a new owner. One last thing for you new folks, if you like this type of uh, YouTube channel with tractors and those kind of things, I'd suggest you check out Joe Lesage. He has a channel and a uh, very talented man. He's got a couple of tractors. But he also not only uses the tractors, but does different things on his property, whether it's, you know, cutting firewood, those kind of things. But he does a lot of fabrication, a lot of work in his workshop on those tractors, pulls them apart, puts them back together again. And it's super interesting stuff, especially if you're trying to learn about how a tractor works. So I'd offer, might be something you want to check out and subscribe to, because you'll get a lot of good content. Anyways, I hope the uh, video was helpful, especially for you new folks. I know several of you had asked for it, and I'm sorry it took me this long to get it out. Uh, really appreciate you sticking around with me. Uh, if you like my channel, please click subscribe, hit the like button, and if you want to know when I'm posting videos, just click the little bell. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you again. Cheers.